Good morning to our friends in France. Good afternoon to our friends in Singapore. And hello to everyone who is tuning in all over the world. Uh, my name is Daniel Tham and I'm Senior Curator with the National Museum of Singapore, uh, where we are streaming live right now. And uh, I'd like to thank you for taking your time to join us today for this digital conference titled Georges Clemenceau and Dr. Lim Boon King, Intertwined Destinies. Um, to start us off, we have a special message recorded uh, for this conference by the French Minister of Europe and Foreign Affairs, Mr. Ledron, uh, who will be speaking to us right now. Mr. Ledron, please. Chers amis, il y a 100 ans, Singapour réservait un accueil triomphal à celui qui, aux yeux de nos alliés et du monde entier, était le visage de la France victorieuse, Clémenceau. Touché par cette ferveur, il s'empressa de faire part de son enthousiasme à ses proches restés dans l'Hexagone. Un enthousiasme que j'ai moi-même ressenti à nombreuses reprises en suivant ses pas à Singapour, le long de la belle avenue qui porte désormais son nom. Singapour, leur écrit-il simplement, est une merveille. Tout est dit. L'enthousiasme fut donc réciproque. Un témoin de cette première visite, car il y en aura une seconde le mois suivant, raconte d'ailleurs que deux jours seulement suffirent à Clémenceau pour devenir l'idole de Singapour. Un coup de foot partagé, voilà en somme ce que nous commémorons aujourd'hui. Cette histoire, au fond, c'est l'histoire d'une découverte mutuelle. Et je laisserai à Kevin Tan, que je remercie pour l'intérêt qu'il porte à notre tigre national, et à Jean-Noël Jeannet, à qui j'adresse un amical salut, le soin d'en retracer les temps forts, comme par exemple cette visite improvisée dans un temple chinois de la ville. Pour ma part, je veux simplement vous dire que je suis très heureux qu'en dépit de la crise pandémique, le festival France-Singapour puisse se tenir à nouveau cette année. C'est un beau symbole de notre capacité collective à aller de l'avant pour construire ensemble, une capacité que Clémenceau, tout au long de sa vie, avait supportée au plus haut point. Face aux épreuves, Clémenceau nous rappelle en effet la puissance de l'unité et de la détermination. Cette leçon, évidemment, résonne d'un très vif écho dans l'histoire et dans le présent de la France, mais aussi bien au-delà, car nous sommes aujourd'hui tous confrontés à une pandémie qui bouleverse chacune de nos vies, comme beaucoup de nos évidences. Et nous devons faire bloc et agir tous ensemble pour venir à bout du virus avec donc unité et détermination. Dans une période de crispation identitaire, Clémenceau l'humaniste nous rappelle aussi l'importance et les vertus du dialogue entre les individus, entre les nations, entre les peuples, entre les civilisations. Dans tous les domaines, les logiques du repli sur soi et du rejet sont non seulement une erreur et une faute, mais aussi une impasse. Nous avons besoin d'ouverture, nous avons besoin d'échanges. C'est particulièrement vrai aujourd'hui pour répondre à nos défis communs. Je pense par exemple aux menaces qui pèsent sur notre santé, sur notre planète et à tous les inconnus de la révolution numérique et pour faire notre monde un monde plus solidaire et plus humain. Enfin, le souvenir de ce voyage entrepris il y a 100 ans par Clémenceau, parce qu'il en est un épisode singulier mais emblématique, nous rappelle la longue histoire que la France, l'Europe et l'Asie ont en partage. Cette histoire, dans un monde affolé où rien ne serait pire que de perdre nos repères, doit encore nous servir de boussole pour marcher ensemble vers l'avenir. C'est le sens de notre partenariat stratégique avec Singapour, c'est le sens de notre engagement aux côtés de l'ASEAN comme partenaire de développement, au service du développement durable, au service de la paix et de la sécurité de la région. Et c'est le sens de la vision que nous portons dans l'Indo-Pacifique à partir de nos territoires de l'océan Indien et de l'océan Pacifique. Une vision fondée sur une exigence d'inclusivité, sur le respect du droit international et sur le multilatéralisme. Voilà, mes chers amis, les, les quelques mots que je tenais à vous adresser depuis Paris, puisque je ne peux malheureusement pas être des vôtres en personne aujourd'hui. Il ne me reste plus qu'à vous souhaiter de passionnants échanges autour de la figure de Clémenceau et de son attachement à Singapour, qui, soyez-en sûr, compte toujours énormément, et dans le cœur, et dans l'imaginaire des Français. This conference uh, that we are holding right now is held in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the visit to Singapore of Georges Clemenceau. 
and coincides as well with the 2020 edition of the Voila French Singapore Festival. Um, the, the conference that we have today, titled Georges Clemenceau and Dr. Lim Boon King, Intertwined Destinies, uh, explores that, um, the events that happened 100 years ago in Singapore. And um, for, for our Singaporean audiences, I think the names uh, Clemenceau and Boon King uh, will ring a bell. Clemenceau Avenue is located quite near uh, to the museum where we are located right now. And Boon King Station uh, is a couple of uh, train rides away on the underground. So uh, what we will talk about today um, has a, a modern day impact, but we will be going back a hundred years to see uh, what happened. Uh, for today, we have uh, two very special guests with us. Uh, we have Mr. Jean-Noël Jeanonnet, who will be speaking to us live from Paris. Um, and he is the president of the Foundation Musée Clemenceau in Paris. And we have Dr. Kevin Tan, uh, who is with us today, um, uh, a law and, and a law professor and historian, uh, and a former president of the Singapore Heritage Society. Um, and they will be speaking about uh, Clemenceau um, and Dr. Lim Boon King, respectively. Um, and for our, all, all our visitors who are tuning in right now to this webinar, uh, please feel free to, to add your, your comments and your questions into the, into the live feed as well. Um, we will be having a, a conversation after, after the, the two talks. Um, I would also like to introduce uh, Ms. Alex Avoine, um, our Irish translator, uh, who will be interpreting today for Mr. Jeanne. To begin with, we will be uh, having a, a talk by Mr. Jean-No Jeanne, and I'd like to introduce him to all of us. He is a historian and French politician. Um, his father, Jean Marcel, was a minister in various French governments in the 1950s and 1960s. His grandfather, Jules Jeanne, was one of Clemenceau's close associates and was once part of the Clemenceau Museum Foundation's Board of Directors. Today, Jean-Noël is the chairman of the foundation, a specialist in political, cultural, and media history. Mr. Jean-Noël taught political history, cultural history, and media history at Sans Po, Paris, subjects which he has also published numerous works on, among various books in other fields. From 1973 to 2009, he was also the author of numerous historical documentaries for television. Mr. Jeanne held many responsibilities in the field of culture and communication. He was notably the president of Radio France and International Radio France from 1982 to 1986, president of the mission of the bicentenary of the French Revolution and of the Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen uh, from 1988 to 1989. He was also Secretary of State for Communication in France from 92 to 93. And finally, the President of the National Library of France from 2002 to 2007. It is with great delight uh, that I would uh, like to invite Mr. Jean Anne to speak to us today. Mr. Jean Anne, please. J'avais eu le privilège de venir à Singapour il y a une vingtaine d'années quand j'appartenais au gouvernement français. Je retrouve Singapour avec bonheur, même si le méchant virus me tient à quelques distances. Mais je pense que grâce à la technique moderne, nous allons néanmoins pouvoir beaucoup échanger. I've had the privilege actually to, to come here in Singapore when I used to be a statesman. Um, I'm, I'm, I wish I had uh, been able to come back here because unfortunately the pandemic forbids it, but I'm really, uh, I'm really delighted to be here with you today. Je suis d'autant plus content que vous m'avez donné l'occasion de célébrer un grand homme, un grand homme pour la France et un grand homme pour l'Asie aussi, puisque Georges Clemenceau a été dans son temps un lien majeur entre l'Extrême-Orient, Singapour notamment au premier chef, et la France. Ce qui s'explique, je crois, par... Euh, sa situation assez particulière dans le milieu politique français, parmi le personnel français. Il est rare, il est, il est, il est hors de pair. 
It, it, we're, I'm really happy actually to, to be celebrating such a, a great man uh, who was a, a major link between uh, France and Asia. Uh, he was uh, particular about Far East and his, his situation also in the French government actually makes him a, a sort of a rare man. Je crois que c'est d'abord son goût de l'indépendance qui frappe et son intérêt pour l'Orient s'explique notamment pour cela. Il est très différent des autres membres du personnel politique français. Il a toujours été farouchement libre et libre en particulier de regarder ailleurs par rapport à ce qu'était la pente ordinaire des, des, des élus, des parlementaires, des ministres qui étaient à l'époque assez repliés sur la France, qui avaient un esprit assez grégaire. He, he always cultivated this, this taste, this uh, uh, flavor of independence, uh, and his interest for uh, the Far East and Asia in general um, really echoes his, his, uh, his independence, whereas uh, people uh, of his time in the government were rather more um, inclined towards themselves. C'est un homme qui a toujours eu le goût des voyages. Il a toujours voulu échapper. C'est une forme d'indépendance à ce qu'il peut y avoir d'un peu étroit dans le fait de rester toujours dans son pays. Dès son jeune âge, il est allé passer plusieurs années aux États-Unis d'Amérique dans les années 1860. Uh, he really enjoyed traveling, and as soon as uh, the early 1860s, he had traveled uh, to the U.S. Son esprit d'indépendance dans la vie politique française l'a toujours placé dans une situation particulière notamment euh, au moment des débuts de notre Troisième République, lorsqu'il s'est situé à gauche de l'éventail euh, parlementaire, ensuite au moment de l'affaire Dreyfus, où il s'est battu contre le conformisme militaire. Euh, et, et après son premier gouvernement, il est allé en Amérique latine également pour faire des conférences, toujours curieux de toute chose extérieure à un pays, la France, qu'il adorait, mais qu'il considérait comme trop étroit si on se bornait à lui. He always thought actually that France was a great country, but um, he always wanted uh, to, how to open the gates and he thought that it was uh, necessary for the, the French environment to open up. And his uh, spirit of independence was certainly um, uh, enshrined actually in, uh, at, the, at the dawn of the Third Republic when he uh, put himself really uh, at the left. Uh, left wing of, of the parliament, and also when the um, uh, Dreyfus uh, scandal uh, ar uh, arose, um, when he was actually against this sort of uh, military conformity, and he uh, pleaded for uh, Dreyfus. He also Après actually uh, had oh, no. several conferences in South America, uh, where he showed also that um, going uh, outside its boundaries was something necessary. Lorsqu'il a acquis la gloire que nous savons comme euh, un personnage qu'en France on a appelé le père la victoire après avoir conduit le pays à, à la fin de la guerre et, et au succès et à l'armistice et à la paix, il a été un peu déçu que le monde politique le rejette et en même temps au fond heureux de retrouver sa liberté. Il est devenu amoureux et il est devenu voyageur à nouveau, ce qu'il adorait. And even after World War I, uh, he mm -hmm. had a certain glory. He was even named uh, father of the victory. Uh, but he, ha he was somehow rejected a little bit by uh, the, the, the political uh, world. Uh, but at the same time, he was really happy to go back to his initial love, uh, this uh, sort of uh, spirit of independence and opening up to other cultures. C'est ainsi que, dans sa retraite très laborieuse, très active, il a été très heureux de reprendre des voyages, il est allé en Égypte et puis surtout il est allé en Extrême-Orient, ce qui pour lui était un, était un rêve qui était enraciné dans une dilection particulière qu'il avait pour, pour l'Asie depuis, depuis son plus jeune âge. He, he had a, a very active retirement and indeed he traveled a lot, first to Egypt and then to his beloved uh, Far East, which was a bit like a dream for him uh, since a very young age. Ce goût pour l'Orient s'était exprimé tout au long de sa carrière de façon différente suivant les moments, mais toujours très, très fermement. Très jeune, il avait souhaité collectionner des œuvres, des œuvres japonaises et des œuvres chinoises. Dans le musée que je préside, il y a encore sur sa table, 
restée telle qu'elle a été au moment de sa mort en 1929. Il y a encore une statuette d'un Bouddha couché qui est très émouvante. His, uh, he, he had a firm taste for uh, anything oriental, and as an orientalist also, he was a, a, an avid collector. He had plenty of uh, Japanese and Chinese items. And for example, in the museum, we have on his uh, table, at his, uh, his very table that uh, um, he kept until his death in 1929, um, a line Buddha uh, that really represents this love. En termes politiques, en termes politiques, dès les années 1880, cette affection qu'il avait pour l'Orient s'est manifestée dans des combats très rudes qu'il a menés dans la vie publique. Par exemple, il s'est affronté à un autre homme d'État qui s'appelait Jules Ferry et qui lui a été l'incarnation de l'effort français de colonisation en rivalité avec notamment le Royaume-Uni, avec le grand, la Grande-Bretagne. Il s'est opposé à cette colonisation et en particulier dans un discours très fameux à la Chambre des députés, il a contredit le chef du gouvernement, Jules Ferry, qui parlait de races inférieures. Le devoir des races supérieures, entendez les Blancs, était d'aller permettre aux races inférieures, entendez les autres, les Noirs, les Jaunes, comme on disait dans les manuels scolaires à l'époque, de les, de les tirer de leur situation inférieure. Et Clémenceau est monté à la tribune et il a fait un discours magnifique qu'on ne se lasse pas de relire. In the 1880s, uh, his uh, law for Orient actually was also echoed in his uh, p uh, public life, in political life. His, um, he even came to a certain struggle with uh, the head of uh, the government at that time, Jules Ferry. Uh, he was in total opposition to, towards his, um, his views on uh, colonization. Jules Ferry was very much in favor of colonization and how also he would look down onto uh, these other races uh, as they were taught at school, uh, the, 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 black, uh, the black ones, the, the, the yellow ones, etc. And he would uh, uh, contradict that all the time. And he had a beautiful speech that uh, he enunciated uh, at the parliament uh, that would contradict the, uh, this sort of uh, demeaning vision of uh, the colonizing world. These formules remain famous in the mémoire politique française, in particular when he was crié contre Jules Ferry, race inférieure, race inférieure. Je me demande bien ce que vous entendez par là. Le, la civilisation chinoise était déjà magnifique il y a un millénaire. Pendant que nous autres, dans le Moyen Âge européen, nous avions simplement des, des, mo des, des, des pauvres paysans à quatre pattes devant les moines. C'était un peu caricatural, mais la formule avait frappé car elle marquait avec beaucoup de force l'hostilité de Clémenceau à la colonisation et sa conviction que l'Extrême-Orient offrait au monde une civilisation magnifique. And his hostility was, was clearly um, uh, seen when he was uh, talking during one of his speeches about um, uh, the inferior races. And he even actually uttered this famous sentence, uh, what about those inferior races? There is no inferior races. And he was referring especially to the Chinese civilization, which was actually uh, um, a, a prominent civilization a thousand years ago, while uh, Europe was still in the Middle Ages and, and, and dealing with peasants and a very feudal uh, system. And he, oui. uh, he was actually one of those who uh, really put up this uh, uh, system down. De la même façon, il s'est opposé violemment, à la fois comme uh, homme politique et comme journaliste, parce qu'il a été un très grand journaliste. Il s'est opposé à la guerre franco-chinoise de 1800. 84-85, et euh, je relève parmi, par exemple, euh, dans un article de 1901, plus tard, il s'écrit « La Chine doit aller aux Chinois, et toute autre position est insupportable. » Un homme qui est un homme de culture, et un homme qui est le fils des Lumières, qui est le meilleur de notre civilisation, mais que parfois nous avons laissé se dégrader, notamment en Extrême-Orient. Uh, he used to be also an active uh, journalist, and during uh, in, the, in 84 and 85, when uh, there was a, a, a struggle with uh, China, uh, he he was in favour of uh, having China going back to China. And in 1901, uh, he published a, an article uh, showing how China actually uh, the, should get its its glory back. 
C'était à l'époque, évidemment, de la révolte des boxers. Euh, le, le goût qu'il avait pour les, la civilisation extrême orientale se manifestait aussi par le nombre des visites qu'il a faites euh, au musée Guimet, qui est, vous le savez peut-être, et, et un, je suis sûr que le directeur du musée le sait, admirablement, euh, le musée Guimet, qui est le lieu où euh, se rassemble, se concentre l'ensemble des œuvres et des études à Paris sur l'Extrême-Orient. C'est d'ailleurs au musée Guimet qu'il y a quelques années, nous avons, vu, nous avons contribué à une magnifique exposition que vous devez connaître sur, euh, sur Clémenceau et l'Asie, où on a pu rassembler tous les témoignages artistiques, intellectuels, littéraires, euh, qui pouvaient montrer quel attachement Clémenceau a pu avoir pour, euh, pour la Chine en général, pour l'Extrême-Orient en général. Cela était très impressionnant. Il aimait bien aller au musée Guimet, d'ailleurs. Ça étonnait un peu les journalistes. Un jour, il est allé assister à une cérémonie au musée et les journalistes, à la sortie, lui ont dit « Mais comment ça, ça se fait-il que vous ayez tellement d'attachement pour la Chine ?» Et il a répondu, c'était à moitié une plaisanterie, à moitié seulement, « Jeune homme, je suis bouddhiste. » His his taste actually for Far East uh, went as far as as uh, having like very frequent um, visits to the Guimet Museum, and as uh, uh, Mr. Tam you would know is um, the Far East Civilization uh, Museum in in Paris, and he would visit on a very regular basis. And uh, a few years ago, there was an exhibition actually about Clemenceau and his love uh, for the Far East with different artistic items, uh, literary attachments, etc., that would really show uh, his entitlement uh, with this uh, civilization. And once uh, he was uh, going out of the museum and someone just hailed him as like, why would you go so often uh, to, to this museum? And he said, Is, are you just uh, so betrothed actually with, uh, with China? And he said, well, you know what? I'm a Buddhist. On trouve aussi euh, trace euh, de cette inclination particulière pour l'Extrême-Orient dans son œuvre théâtrale. Il a voulu être romancier. Entre nous, il n'a pas produit des chefs-d'œuvre universels du côté du roman, mais il a voulu aussi faire une pièce de théâtre qui est resté célèbre en France et qui s'appelle « Le voile du bonheur ». Le thème général, c'est celui d'un sage chinois qui est aveugle et à qui on redonne la vue. Mais ce qu'il voit lui déplaît tellement qu'il demande de redevenir aveugle. Vous voyez la portée philosophique un peu ironique de cette thématique-là. And also to um, underline his strong inclination towards um, uh, the Far East, uh, it's really shown with uh, his play, uh, which is still very famous until now, uh, The Veil of Happiness. He wasn't uh, a, a great novelist, but this play uh, remains actually a, a clear uh, um, masterpiece. Um, it was about, uh, it is about a, a wise uh, Chinese man who's blind and who's turned back into uh, sight, uh, but he is so disappointed with all what he's, uh, he can see that he goes back uh, to being blind again. He's, he's asking for it. Je me réjouis naturellement, vivement, que l'ambassade, l'ambassadeur Abinsour et son équipe aient souhaité redonner vie à cette œuvre qui a à la fois été montrée au théâtre et qui a donné l'occasion de faire des films qui sont en partie perdus, mais nous sommes actuellement sur la piste de pellicules anciennes qui permettraient de les restituer pour, pour l'essentiel. Et c'est un des résultats les plus très heureux de, de cet événement d'aujourd'hui. Je tiens à rendre hommage à ceux qui sont sur la piste de cette reconstitution. I really acknowledge uh, the role of uh, the French embassy and uh, uh, His Excellency uh, the ambassador of France and his team for really uh, re-enlivening actually all this uh, culture. There are even ancient reels, uh, film reels that are going to be uh, uh, hopefully um, uh, renovated and, and be shown. Et puis naturellement, cet amour de l'Orient s'est exprimé de façon éclatante lors de ce grand voyage de septembre 1920 à mars 1921, sept mois durant que Clémenceau a accompli et dont la visite à Singapour a été un moment particulièrement précieux qui euh, a été dans sa mémoire quelque chose d'essentiel. On en retrouve les traces dans ses écrits ultérieurs et on est bien renseigné sur cette visite par... Euh, des lettres qu'il a pu écrire par le témoignage de ses collaborateurs qui l'accompagnaient, 
par la presse de Singapour dans ce moment-là. Euh, tout, tout ça a été rassemblé dans un excellent écrit de Mathieu Seguela, qui a fait sa thèse sur, euh, sur Clémenceau et le Japon, et qui euh, a travaillé sur cette question. Je tiens à lui rendre hommage en passant. And of course, uh, paramount to all of that, there's this uh, uh, visit uh, from Clemenceau in September 1920 to 1921 to Singapore, which remains actually a very precious moment. Um, we can see that in his writings, but also in the press of the time. Everything is really relevant about uh, the moment, uh, his meetings. And we can see also that a lot of these uh, uh, collected moments, whether they are pictures or else, Uh, were put together by Mathieu Seguela, who wrote his uh, PhD thesis about uh, Clemenceau in Japan. And I truly want also to uh, celebrate uh, this young man now for his work. Je sais que ici on connaît bien l'histoire de cette visite qui a eu beaucoup d'aspects différents, mais qui a été marquée chez Clemenceau par une sorte de bonheur continuel, qui, qui s'explique notamment par la chaleur de, de l'accueil. Il a été accueilli véritablement comme un, comme un chef d'État. Et le fait qu'on ait donné devant lui ce nom à Boulevard Clémenceau, son nom, il n'a pas du tout dissimulé le bonheur qu'il en éprouvait. Le fait que ce soit aujourd'hui le centième anniversaire exactement de cette inauguration, voilà qui réjouit le cœur d'un Français, d'un citoyen français, et qui ne peut que réjouir tous ceux qui sont attachés à l'amitié entre le magnifique Singapour et la France en particulier. We can only rejoice, actually, uh, uh, because of this 100th anniversary uh, of uh, this uh, visit, uh, of this friendship between France and, and Singapore. Um, this visit, Clemenceau actually named it as a sort of a continuous happiness. He had a very warm and honorable welcome, uh, just like a statesman. And until even uh, the avenue that was named after him, that brought him actually utter happiness, which is into his writings as well. Le gouverneur britannique, qui était d'origine française, d'ailleurs, Lord Guimard, a, a manifesté à Clemenceau en tant qu'appartenant au Royaume-Uni et donc au grand allié de la France pendant la Grande Guerre, a manifesté une considération, des gestes de toutes sortes. Mais peut-être a-t-il été encore plus touché par l'accueil de la communauté chinoise. Il a rencontré aussi les autres communautés, mais c'est la communauté chinoise que, naturellement, il a fréquenté avec le plus de bonheur. Et cette communauté s'est incarnée dans la personnalité de Lim Boon Kang, euh, dont on va nous parler tout à l'heure. Je suis très, très curieux de savoir ce que le docteur euh, Tan va nous en dire. Euh, c'est Lim Boon Kang qui lui a dit « Vous êtes ici chez vous », ce qui l'a beaucoup touché. Il a répondu, euh, j'ai trouvé un foyer chinois, vous m'avez donné un pays, vous m'avez donné un pays. Clémenceau était d'un tempérament assez rugueux et il ne se laissait pas aller très souvent au sentimentalisme. Il n'a pas dit ça ailleurs, il l'a dit ici, à Singapour, d'une façon qui a beaucoup touché. Um, he also, when Clemenceau came, he, he had met actually uh, the British governor, Lord Gilmard, uh, of course, naturally, because he was part of the Allies after the Great World War. Um, and uh, Clemenceau actually really enjoyed this uh, great uh, consideration, but he really keeps a, a very um, warm uh, memory of the Chinese community and especially his meeting with uh, Dr. Lim Boon Kang. Um, someone uh, that I would be very happy uh, to hear more about, and uh, I'm curious actually uh, about what Mr. Tan will be will be talking about. He, Mr. Boon Kang, actually said to Clemenceau, "You're here at home," and uh, Clemenceau answered back, um, "You gave me a country." which was very unusual for this man, who was a rather uh, tough, uh, introvert person, uh, who wouldn't accept uh, um, uh, compliments very, very, very quickly. And so this shows really uh, the impact of this visit. Nous allons entendre euh, du côté du docteur le, le récit de cette rencontre. Elle a été, elle a été exceptionnelle, elle a été exceptionnelle et, et c'est un... Le docteur Boon Keng, qui a conduit Clémenceau dans plusieurs lieux emblématiques de la civilisation chinoise à Singapour. Je pense en particulier à plusieurs rencontres qui ont été improvisées à ce temple chinois de Ballister Road, où il a, où il a trouvé 
un accueil qui, qui, qui rencontrait absolument sa, son attrait, son goût pour la civilisation chinoise et en particulier son intérêt pour la religion chinoise. Clémenceau était anticlérical en France. Il se méfiait de toute influence de la religion catholique sur le fonctionnement de l'État et de la société. Il avait été un des, un des inspirateurs de la loi de laïcité, de sécularisation de 1905. Et en même temps, il était passionné par les religions, par leur histoire et par leur dogme. And also we can uh, see in this exceptional encounter, bet encounter sorry, between uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lin Bun Kang and Mr. Uh, Clemenceau that uh, you also had a sort of a, um, a friendship that was uh, put together as uh, Mr. Kang led uh, Clemenceau to visit em emblematic places of the Chinese civilization in, uh, in Singapore. And just like, for example, this uh, temple on Ballastier Road It's actually quite uh, not paradoxical, but interesting to see that in France, Clemenceau was someone uh, he, he was an anti-cleric. He was against uh, um, the, the, the role of religion within state. Um, and he, I, he had even fought in uh, 1905 uh, for the law that would separate uh, religion uh, from uh, the exercise of the state. But he was passionate about religions and he was passionate about uh, understanding how civilizations uh, were, uh, were building together. Plus tard, dans sa magnifique vieillesse, il a rédigé un très gros livre qui s'appelle Au soir de la pensée, où il rassemble, <coughs> il rassemble tout ce qu'il peut penser de l'univers, les questions qu'il se pose. Les, les, C'est vraiment. Un, le cas d'un vieillard magnifique qui euh, nourrit cet euh, ouvrage très largement de la, culture, euh, de la culture chinoise et qui à plusieurs reprises fait allusion à cette visite à Singapour qui l'a tellement marqué. In, uh, at the very end of his life, uh, even in a, in a book uh, entitled uh, His Late Thoughts, Uh, at the eve of, of, uh, of uh, his death. Uh, he would also put together uh, all his uh, memories and also his impressions uh, that he got from this visit, but also with all the reflections that he had uh, about this uh, civilization. Je voudrais ajouter que toute sa vie, Clémenceau s'est beaucoup intéressé aux questions d'enseignement, d'éducation. La France a été à l'époque déchirée entre ceux qui pensaient qu'il convenait de, de, de s'en remettre en grande partie à l'Église catholique pour s'en occuper et ceux qui étaient au contraire laïcs. Euh, Clémenceau a demandé à visiter avec le docteur Bunkeng des, des écoles et en particulier l'école que je vois s'appeler Young Cheng School euh, et, et également une école de jeunes filles où il a eu l'occasion de s'adresser aux jeunes gens qui étaient là et de saluer leur maître et la manière à la fois libérale et, et, et très civique dont leur éducation était organisée. There's another aspect in uh, Clemenceau's life which is worth <coughs> mentioning. Um, throughout his life, he was very much interested um, in education. And as much as in, in France at that time, a lot of people thought that uh, education should rely on to Catholic values and approaches. Um, he, he was happy actually to visit when in Singapore, the Yanchen School and the girls' school with uh, uh, Dr. Kang. And as really uh, enjoyed the sort of uh, liberal approach and the civic manners uh, that uh, these children were taught. Je pense à l'école des filles de Hill Street, qui était vraiment, nous le savons, la première école chinoise pour filles à Singapour. Le docteur Lim Bunkeng avait joué un rôle essentiel. Et je suis très, très frappé de ce que Clémenceau, nous le savons, a pu dire à ces jeunes filles sur l'avenir de, de la femme dans la société. C'était très prémonitoire de notre 21e siècle, me semble-t-il. Clémenceau appartenait à une génération qui était un peu méfiant à l'égard du vote des femmes. Il n'y a pas de raison de le cacher, parce qu'il pensait, en France, que l'Église catholique aurait trop d'influence sur leur vote. Mais sur la longue durée, il a toujours affirmé la nécessité d'une égalité entre la femme et l'homme. Et je ne me prive pas du plaisir de citer un propos qu'il a tenu devant ces jeunes filles de la Chinese Girls School à Hill Street. 
And uh, there's also uh, something special about this visit uh, uh, at the girls' school in Hill Street. Uh, Hill Street, sorry. Um, and it's it's actually the way he spoke uh, to these uh, younger ladies, and and the way he he um, he saw actually the, the the teaching, and he was very happy actually that uh, Dr. Kang uh, brought him there because of course in his generation uh, he also believed that uh, uh, women uh, were not supposed to have uh, the right to vote because they would be too influenced uh, by the Catholic uh, religion. However, he knew uh, the forthcoming role of women uh, in the future and he was very happy to embody uh, this, this future role. And he, because he strongly believed in, in, in inequality and he knew that this would be coming later. C'est un des domaines où sa rencontre intellectuelle et civique avec le docteur Boon Kang me paraît le plus frappant. Il avait le plaisir de citer la formule, le principe du docteur Boon Kang, « Keep your women in a low, ignorant and servile state, and in the time you become a low, ignorant and servile people. » Ça, vous n'aurez pas besoin de traduire, vous pourrez vous reposer un instant, madame. Euh, C'est une pensée qui, qui, qui rejoignait exactement celle de Clémenceau, qui disait, au sujet de l'éducation que reçoit la femme, je trouve qu'on l'exclut trop de la culture intellectuelle. La femme joue un rôle important dans la société, mettez l'homme et la femme sur le pied d'égalité, afin que la femme, lorsque le moment viendra, soit capable de remplir ses devoirs d'électeur, de voir que les hommes ne remplissent pas toujours bien quand ils les remplissent. Fin de citation. And this is actually something interesting uh, that really embodies uh, this encounter between uh, Dr. Lim Boon Ken and uh, George Clemenceau. It's this sort of intellectual and civic uh, link that they had together. And uh, Mr. Clemenceau, who uh, was very much in favor uh, later of the, uh, the, 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 the women's vote, uh, showed actually how, through uh, the quote that um, I just uh, talked about, uh, that no women uh, should be uh, right away excluded. Everyone should be on an equal footing. And when time comes, uh, women will be able to fulfill uh, their full uh, voting duty. Voilà ce que j'avais à peu près envie de vous dire, mais pour finir, laissez-moi me pencher avec émotion sur ce qui est arrivé il y a tout juste un siècle, avec l'inauguration de cette, de cette avenue qui est toujours là, une des plus belles avenues du monde. Avoir honoré Clémenceau de cette façon-là, c'est pour un Français quelque chose qui, qui, qui le touche au cœur, bien sûr. Et on ne peut que, que citer ce que... Le docteur Lim Boon Kang lui a dit, et que les historiens rapportent, Clémenceau, Monsieur le Président, vous êtes ici chez vous. Et la réponse de Clémenceau, j'ai trouvé un foyer chinois, vous m'avez donné un pays. Sans être exagérément romantique, exagérément solennel, exagérément pompeux, on a bien le droit, me semble-t-il, à l'aube des cérémonies que vous avez souhaité organiser, on a bien le droit de dire que ce moment-là et que cet échange touche au cœur et reste dans nos mémoires d'une façon indélébile. Je vous remercie de votre attention. And I, I finally want to really express uh, my, um, not only my sympathy, but my uh, dear uh, uh, delight uh, about this event. And when I look at uh, this event that's now celebrating it, its uh, 100th anniversary, uh, When uh, Mr. Uh, Lim Boon Kang uh, said, uh, you found uh, a home here, and then Mr. Clemenceau answered, well, I definitely found uh, a, a Chinese household, my household here. Uh, there's nothing romantic or even pompous. Uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, such a pompous thing, thing that to say, um, I am really now uh, uh, enjoying this moment, and I think it's really important to show uh, the Uh, the, the, the major part of this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jonane, for the talk. Uh, I greatly appreciated the, uh, the perspective that you've brought, uh, not just for uh, uh, that, that bigger overview of uh, Georges Clemenceau's life, but his connection to Asia, 
uh, and, and specifically uh, to Singapore. And, and what I can see here, that, that uh, almost intimate friendship that he struck with Dr. Lim Boon King. I, I um, as, a, as a curator, I, I really appreciated the, uh, the anecdote that you shared as well of the many times that he visited uh, the Gime Museum. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that definitely resonates with me. Uh, and, and I'm also aware of the exhibition on, on Clemenceau's uh, time in Asia more broadly that was, that was held at the Gimei Museum, uh, I think, about five or six years ago. Um, so I think it's, it's very timely that uh, on this occasion we are able to, to focus uh, even more specifically about uh, his time in Singapore. And uh, with that, I, I'm very, very happy to uh, pass the time uh, to, to Dr. Kevin Tan. And, 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 and Dr. Tan will be speaking to us about Lim Boon King, so to, to, to connect the dots for us, so to speak, today. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll um, speak a little bit about uh, Dr. Tan. He, he is a, a law professor and historian. Uh, and he was for a decade, actually, from 2001 to 2011, uh, the president of the Singapore Heritage Society. And in fact, was the curator for, for the exhibition on Dr. Lim Boon King. Um, it was titled Lim Boon King, A Life to Remember. And that was held at the National Library of Singapore in, in 2007. Um, until recently, Kevin was also the, the president of the Singapore National Committee of the International Council on Monuments and Sites. Um, and he has written and edited over 50 books uh, on the law, history, and politics of Singapore. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass the time to, to Dr. Tan, who will share with us about Dr. Lim Boon King. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's a great honour to be here uh, to talk about this uh, momentous event that took place 100 years ago. The title of our session here, Georges Clemenceau and Lim Boon King, Intertwined Destinies, is a little bit misleading because it suggests that they've actually known each other for a very long time. So let's, let's take a look at what really happened uh, with uh, Clemenceau's visit to Singapore. Um, Georges Clemenceau, of course, because of his very fierce nationalism and great courage, was known as the Tiger in, in France. And so um, I'm, I will refer to him from time to time as the Tiger in Singapore. Um, the visit that he uh, took to Singapore was part and parcel of a six-month uh, post-retirement Asia trip that he had been dreaming about for a very long time. So Singapore was just one leg of this rather long visit, and he spent about uh, five or six days in Singapore, depending on how, how you count it. So on the 17th of October 1920, he arrives in Singapore on board the MM Cordillier. Uh, he came from Medan. So he was actually touring what was then the Dutch East Indies or Indonesia uh, for some time, and then from Medan came to Singapore, and actually from Singapore went back to Medan, uh, went back to Java, uh, and, and continued his tour of Indonesia. Um, didn't do too much on the first day he was here. He met Governor Gilamad, who hosted him and housed him at government building, or what is now the Istana in Singapore. On the 18th of October, uh, he spent most of the day meeting up with the French community, he met up with the French community in Singapore. Uh, there were French miners and so on from Malaya who came down specifically to meet him. He also met members of the Catholic mission, businessmen. Uh, he was hosted to lunch by French miners. And then, of course, you can't do without this in Singapore. He went shopping in the afternoon. So he went uh, down to what was then Commercial Square. Uh, now we call it Raffles Place and Hill Street which were then, at the time, really the meccas of shopping in Singapore. And in the evening, he went and conducted a naval inspection, and then again, the French community hosted him at the, then, uh, at the Tanglin Club. So it's pretty amazing if you look at this uh, itinerary for a man who's 79 years old, 
and and in many accounts, they all remarked at how energetic and vigorous he was throughout the visit. And in fact, some of them said that they had a hard time keeping up with him. Now, on the 19th of October, he visited a, uh, the Chinese temple in Ballastia Road, which was mentioned by uh, Mr. Janadier. Uh, and then he also went to the General Hospital. And in the evening, he is hosted to a dinner party by the straight Chinese community. Now, in those days, the Chinese community in Singapore was really fragmented or divided into two groups. There were the Chinese educated members of the Chinese community uh, who generally did not speak English, did not have too much interface with the British and the English speaking community. Uh, and then you had the straight born Chinese and they were uh, the Peranakans and the, you know, the local born English educated Chinese and they were the ones who hosted him. Uh, this was his very first meeting with Lim Boon Kei. It was at the Garden Club. I'm not sure which branch of the Garden Club they met because there were actually three locations uh, of the Garden Club at that time. There was one in Cane Hill, one in town and in Raffles Place, and then another one up in Panamera. So it could have been any one of them, but we couldn't tell from the newspaper reports where, where they actually met. And the Garden Club was headed by Dr. Lim Boon King, who had founded the club about four years earlier. Now, it is in fact at this particular uh, uh, dinner that Lim Boon King made the speech whereby he welcomed Kermin Shur and he said, you are now home uh, because, you know, this is your country. Uh, Kermin Shur, of course, was extremely puzzled and uh, Lim Boon King then showed him a bunch of stamps with a tiger on it. And so he said, well, you're home. Look, uh, you know, this is where the tiger lives. Uh, of course, uh, you, you know, he, he took very uh, well to this uh, particular reference to him and his great reputation. Now, Lim Boon King was to meet him again the next day when they were going to tour Yongzheng School, right? Or Yongqing School, um, which was up in Club Street. Uh, uh, if you look at the photograph on the top right of this uh, slide, you can see what Yongzheng School looked like back in those days. Um, it was uh, a, a, a Cantonese uh, es establishment. In other words, uh, uh, the lessons were actually conducted in Cantonese rather than in Mandarin Chinese, right? Which is uh, which is something that I will come to in a moment. And so, again, he gets to meet uh, Clement Sir, and he takes him to 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 visit um, the school, uh, and then they go and they visit. Uh, Yu Tong Sen, a very important businessman. Yu Tong Sen uh, was uh, one of the richest businessmen in Singapore at the time. Uh, you can see his photograph on the bottom right of this slide. Um, it's not clear why he visited Yu Tong Sen. Uh, although Yu Tong Sen was a very wealthy man, he wasn't exactly a leader of the Chinese community. Uh, and after that, they went to see Xia Liang Xia who you see at the center of the, uh, among the three gentlemen you see in the slide. Xia Liang Xia was a former uh, leader uh, or an elder of the Chinese community and in fact uh, was Lim Boon King's predecessor in the Legislative Council. Uh, but the main reason that Clement wanted to see Xia Liang Xia was because of his incredible collection of Chinese antiques and antiquities. So this dovetails very nicely with his interest in, you know, sort of uh, Asian artifacts. And then later on, uh, they went to enjoy a game of polo uh, at the polo club, who was at that, which was at the time in Ballastia Road. And then dinner with the governor and Lady Gallimard, uh, Sir Lawrence Gallimard, you see on the bottom left of the, uh, among the photos in the slide. Um, on the next day, he visits uh, E.S. Nathan. E.S. Nathan was a very prominent Jewish business person. Um, he was not the leader of the Jewish community. That would have been Sir Manasseh Meyer. Uh, and one could only f uh, imagine that 
his visit to Nathan was largely because Nathan's mother was actually French and their families could well have known each other uh, 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 from, from uh, long ago. And then, of course, later on in the afternoon, he is fatted again at a garden party hosted by the governor and Lady Gallimard uh, at Government House, where members of all the different communities in Singapore were invited to. And then, on the morning of the 22nd of October, he visits the town convent, the convent of the Holy Infant Jesus, which was a French established estab uh, uh, convent. Uh, and then he went for the inauguration of Clementshire Avenue before de departing for Java, right? And so, of course, this is a photograph of the inauguration of Clementshire Avenue. Uh, of course, if you try and imagine where this might be today, it may be a little bit difficult because, you know, the landscape has changed so dramatically already, right? Now, meeting up with Limbun King, what might they have spoken about and what, how would they have conversed with each other is anybody's guess because nobody actually had an account of it. Uh, but they could well have been conversing in a mixture of English and French because Dr. Limbun King was known to be a very good linguist. He could speak six, seven languages and certainly French was one of them. So it could have been English as well as a little bit of French, uh, and uh, that might be how they would have conversed. I'm sure there were many topics of possible conversation. So who was this man? Who was Lim Boon King? Why was he important? Uh, you know, what was his significance? Uh, meeting, uh, you know, among all the people other than the governor, why did Lim Boon King meet uh, Clemenceau twice? Nobody else did, right? Um, so, let me tell you a little bit about Lim Boon King, one of the great sons of Singapore. He was born in the, on the 18th of October, so again, very interesting because that's not too many days away from uh, today. Uh, in 1869 in Singapore, and he was the third son of uh, Lim Tian Giao. We don't know too much about Lim Tian Giao other than that he was a minor trader. Uh, Lim Boon King studied first, like many uh, young boys, uh, Chinese boys in those days, if their parents sent them to school, they would have gone to a local Chinese language school. And because the Lims were Hokkien's, or from Fujian province, uh, they went to a, a, a Chinese school operated by a Hokkien clan association, at least for the first couple of years. And then later on, the father enrolled him in an English elementary school at Cross Street. Uh, in 1879, when he was 10 years old, uh, uh, he would have finished his elementary uh, education and he entered Raffles Institution, which was and remains uh, the premier school in Singapore. And back then, of course, uh, Raffles Institution uh, was the main government school. Uh, in 1887, uh, he competed for and obtained the second place in the Queen's Scholarship Examination. Uh, this was the most prestigious scholarship at the time. Uh, and they, um, uh, he was able, with the money that he got from the scholarship, able to proceed to the University of Edinburgh to read medicine. Right? Uh, so, in a way, here you see the first similarity between him and Clemenceau. Clemenceau was also trained as a doctor, but unlike Clemenceau, who came from a line of three generations of doctors, Lim Boon King was in fact the first doctor of his, of his family. Um, he graduated with first class honours and won the Ethel Medal for Academic Excellence at the University of Edinburgh. Now, more important than his academic accomplishments was the fact that at the time, Lim Boon King actually knew very little Mandarin Chinese. And he was very embarrassed by the fact that one of the professors he met there seemed to have, was able to speak much better Mandarin and, and do better calligraphy than he could ever do. And so, in a way, he felt very embarrassed by this exposure to a Westerner who seemed to know his culture better than him. And this led to 
uh, his development as a very bicultural person. Now, carrying on with Lim Boon King, he came back to Singapore in May of 1893, and immediately he went to work. He established a very small medical practice on Telok Ayer Street, where his family used to live. And uh, two years later, when he was only 26 years old, he was appointed a member of the Straits Settlements Legislative Council in place of Xia Liang Xia, who I mentioned earlier. Now, there was some opposition to appointing him to the council because he was considered too young. He was only 26 years old. Uh, you, you know, they did not consider him at that age to be somebody that the entire community knew or respected. But he certainly had made uh, an impression on everybody uh, from the time he returned home, and I'll show you why in a moment. 1896, he was appointed member of the Raffles Library and Museum, and the following year, he went on into partnership with Dr. Murray Robertson, and they set up a clinic, this time in the middle of town at uh, Raffles Square, Commercial Square, uh, called the Dispensary, and they practiced there for about the next decade. Now, Lim Boon King was not just a doctor, obviously. His importance in Singapore's uh, uh, development uh, came from the fact that he was involved in a multitude of public service and civil engagements. So from the time he came back in 1893, he already began to campaign for educational reform in Singapore and uh, fight against opium smoking. All right? there are two, these are two important causes that he, take, he took up as a very young man. One, because he felt that education should be much more liberalized. Although he was an elite who had won a scholarship, he felt that education should be much more universal. And very importantly, they should be extended to females, not just the males. Right? So this was something that he was very anxious to do. The second thing was that having begun to think of himself as a Chinese rather than a sort of a, a, a Chinese who happened to be in a British colony, he began to study the problems that China was facing and came to the conclusion that one of the most devastating things that could have happened and is weakening the entire Chinese nation was opium smoking. And that he saw not just in China, but also in Singapore, right? So Singapore was at the time a major opium hub and he wanted to end opium smoking. In 1897, he, he does something else. He establishes something called the Chinese Philomatic Society, which was really a society for Chinese persons to appreciate English literature. So you see, he's a very interesting person in the sense that he tries to bring the West to the Chinese community, and he tries to bring uh, the Chinese community in, into the West as well, right? And so he, sent, he sets this up together with uh, two of his good friends, Se Song Ong Xiang and uh, Ngo Liang Tak or uh, Wu Lian Te. If you look at the photo in this slide, uh, Lim Boon Keng is highlighted in yellow. Uh, by this time, his, his hairline had receded. He looked much older than he, he, he was. Uh, and he began, he grew a, a moustache and he therefore looked really quite old. But he wasn't, he wasn't that old. Um, uh, on the left of the photo is uh, Song Ong Xiang, who won the Queen's Scholarship and went to Cambridge University and read law. And uh, in the middle of the picture is Ngo Lian Tak, in, probably the most famous among the three. Mo Lian Tak, or known better by his uh, uh, Mandarin name, Wu Lian Te, was known as the plague fighter. And he had gone to Manchuria at the request of the Chinese uh, nationalist government to deal with the Manchurian plague. And so, in fact, uh, you, you know, many of the techniques that we have developed in containing COVID-19 and various other pandemics were, were pioneered by somebody like Ngo Lian Tak. Anyway, these three persons decided that they would also promote, you know, uh, education and literature and, you know, uh, uh, philosoph uh, philosophical studies among the Chinese community by establishing the Straits Chinese magazine. Um, so, Lim Boon Keng uh, doesn't only publish in English, he goes into the Chinese press, he teams up with Ku Siok Wan, uh, great literati, Chinese literati, 
very rich man, and they published a, 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 a newspaper called Tianshan Xinbao uh, to advocate reform in China, and he also begins to teach Mandarin to straight Chinese uh, at his home. Now, so this is only a few years after he came back, and uh, Lin Bun King was obviously a very gifted linguist because he, he not only mastered Mandarin very quickly, he could read Chinese in Cantonese as well. He mastered Russian, he could speak French, so uh, he's obviously a very clever guy, right? Uh, he was. And in 1898, he again goes back to this question of education, and he sets up with Song Ong Siang and a number of other people, the Singapore Chinese Girls School, SGS. He also launches a crusade against the Q, uh, the, the, the Tao Chang, right? The, um, uh, he, he wanted people to, to, as a sign of modernity and, and to cast off the vestiges of the past, he wanted to get rid of the queue. 1900, he establishes the Straits Chinese British Association, which is the precursor of today's Peranakan Association, uh, with Tan Jiak Kim, Xia Liang Xia, and Song Hong Xiang again. Uh, and then in 1906, uh, he and his brother-in-law, uh, S.C. Yin, they established the Anti-Opium Society. He also goes to Java and he establishes five schools uh, for the teaching of Mandarin, right? So, we were not done here, right? 1911, he publishes a book analyzing the problems in China called The Chinese Crisis from Within. And five years later, he sets up the Chinese Chamber of Commerce together with a number of other business persons. Uh, he mediates uh, a, a, a riot uh, between the Hokkien's and the Teochews, uh, and then he uh, is appointed medical advisor to Chinese uh, Ministry of Interior and the Inspector General of Hospitals in Beijing. So here, you actually see the Chinese Nationalist government tapping on him. Now, uh, my time is running very quickly, so very quickly, he, he founded uh, the Malay Tribune, another newspaper, he wrote a number of tracts where he's encouraging the Chinese to be good uh, British subjects, right? Uh, and he even uh, chaired a Tianjin Flood Relief Fund, right? received an honorary degree of law from the Hong Kong University. He also goes into business in a big way, uh, and uh, among other things, went into rubber planting, together with Tan Che Yen, Li Chun Guan, these are big names in the rubber industry. Later on, he sets up two banks. One, the Chinese Commercial Bank in 1912. Later on, the Overseas Chinese Bank in 1919. In 1932, these two banks, together with the unit, uh, 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 another uh, Ho Hong Bank, they become the Overseas Chinese Banking Corporation, or OCBC. 1920, he um, also sets up an uh, Overseas Assurance Company, or uh, the first locally uh, owned insurance company. Uh, all of this came to an end in 1921 when he was invited by Tan Kha Ki, uh, the local, uh, he was known as the Henry Ford of Singapore, the richest man, uh, rubber baron and, and, and patriot. And Tan Kha Ki had set up Amoy University in Xiamen or Amoy. And he wanted Lim Boon King to be the president of this university. So here, Lim Boon King, you know, the educationist, uh, takes on this new role. It was not a happy time for him because, um, well, in a way, he fell on the wrong side of history. He was an advocate of reform rather than of revolution. So he wanted to reform China from within using Confucianism as a way of reform. But what, and what happened was, of course, he got overtaken by the more revolutionary forces. So, you, you know, his, his fight with Lu Xun, uh, probably uh, one of the greatest writers uh, chi uh, of modern China, uh, was, was, was uh, uh, I think, symptomatic of this, or represented this in a serious way, because uh, he had a fight, he sacked Lu Xun, but Lu Xun, uh, of course, he became the, the much more important person in, in so far as the modernization of China was concerned. And so he was there for 16 years, returning to Singapore in 1937, when Tan Kaki, uh, by that time, had gone bust and had returned, uh, had handed over the whole university to the Chinese government. He came back to Singapore at age 68. He more or less has retired by then. He's an elder statesman, gives talks here and there. 
uh, he remains very faithful to China. He helps Tan Kaki rally the local Chinese to support the Chinese Relief Fund uh, and fight against the Japanese invasion of China. Uh, Tan Kaki was the leader of the sort of non English speaking group of Chinese locals and he led the English speaking group. He also agitates for the establishment of the University of Malaya. Uh, but that doesn't happen for at least another 10 years. And the sad and tragic thing was during the Japanese occupation, when Singapore was invaded in 1942, Lim Boon King actually was herded along with everybody else to a concentration camp, and they spotted him. The Japanese spotted him, they knew who he was. There was a danger that they were going to execute him because he had been very active in the China Relief Fund, in other words, he was anti-Japanese, uh, but they decided they had more users for him. So they forced him to actually be the president and the founder of the Overseas Chinese Association, right? which was actually a pro-Japanese association. And you can see that in this picture. This was taken outside the headquarters of the Overseas Chinese Association, which was really the Chinese Chamber of Commerce in Hill Street. And they actually forced him into this role when they, they, they forced his wife to kneel in the mid midday sun uh, for hours and hours and hours. So in the end, he, forced, uh, he, he was forced to take on this role. Uh, did not take part in these deliberations. He, he deliberately portrayed himself as a drunken old man. And so he would always pretend to be drunk. Uh, um, and um, and the, the, in the end, they thought he was just useless. Right um, uh, After the war... Uh, he was absolved of any accusations of collaboration with the Japanese uh, because of that leadership of the Overseas Chinese Association. He established and became the president of the China Society and he finally he passed away in um, 1957 at the age of 88. Right? Uh, I think he lived almost as, as, as long as Clemenceau. So that's Lim Boon King and maybe as a very quick summing up, I would say that the, the two men were were very similar in, in a couple of respects. Um, first of all, I think, uh, you know, you would find that they were both um, uh, doctors who did not practice. Lim Boon Kang practiced for about 10 years. Clemenshaw sure certainly didn't. Uh, they were both humanists, although not religious. So they were, they were believed in inclusiveness of, of religious faiths. Uh, Lim Boon Kang was... Uh, uh, or more, you know, a Confucianist than a, a Buddhist, although he was patron of the Buddhist Association, but they were both humanists in that respect. They both opposed the ancient, uh, the ancient regime, corruption, despotism, and the enslavement of women. They, they, they wanted women to be liberated and to be thought equal with everybody. They despised monarchist governments. Uh, they were extremely patriotic, but in different ways. Right? Because, of course, Clemenceau, it was always France. And it was France against Germany, France against the others. Whereas Lim Boon King was, in a way, a, a, a cultural patriot. Right? He was a Chinese in a British colony. He was faithful as a British subject, yet faithful also uh, to a land that he, had never, that he was not born in, but was the, the land of his father. And finally, both of them were men of letters. They believe in the power of the written word and in writing and publishing uh, and moving and changing people's perspectives uh, through the written word and through education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan, for that uh, breathtaking tour, um, not just of the meeting of, of these two men 100 years ago, uh, but also of the, of the life of Dr. Lim Boon King. And uh, I'm, I'm just amazed at how much he had gone through, uh, uh, not to mention how much he achieved and, and, and contributed uh, during, during his time. Um, I, I thought to, to open this time right now for, for us to, to have a discussion and, and, I, I, and I thought, uh, Dr. Tan, what you, how you summarised uh, your, your talk uh, gives us lots to, to think about uh, in terms of the, the similarities between the two, um, which, which I think really uh, explains um, the question that you mentioned at the start. Why, why did they meet more than once? Uh, there, there, was, there was surely that uh, uh, that that 
uh, similarity and that uh, like-mindedness, I would say, uh, that, that brought them together? Well, I think the fact that they met twice was not... Uh, I mean, I don't think it was something that they had planned uh, in a sense of, oh, let's meet up again because we enjoy talking to each other. It was really, in a way, uh, Lim Boon King fulfilling his official duties, first as the leader of the Straits Chinese and as president of the Garden Club uh, hosting the dinner. And then the next day, because he was also considered the leader of the Chinese community, uh, to take him to visit the Chinese school, that would have been the most uh, natural thing to do. And of course, Lim Boon King could also act as his translator because he spoke very fluent Cantonese as well. Yeah. That's, that's quite amazing. I'm just trying to imagine what those conversations and those, those meetings would be like. Um, and and uh, to, 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 to just look, uh, to just zoom out uh, a little bit uh, to look at the two okay. men. I think sure. just just reflecting upon what you've shared, uh, Dr. Tan and 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 Mr. Jean Anne, what what you have shared as well uh, about uh, about the life of George Clemenceau and and uh, and the things that he stood for, um, whether it was uh, equality, whether it was the the rejection of what was very. Uh, prevalence at that time in terms of uh, uh, racial and, and, and very racist kind of stereotypes of, of, of other peoples. Um, it really strikes me that both men, uh, while, while we often think of, of, of historical figures uh, largely as products of their time, um, they were also ahead of their time in some, in some way. Um, they, 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 they challenge our, our views of, 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 of people from the past. And, and, and I think they, they offer us a much more complex uh, kind of, of persona to, to, to understand. So my, my question then, how, how do we explain uh, where this comes from? Uh, why do you think they were so ahead of their time? And, and perhaps I will uh, address uh, Mr. John Anne first and then to, to Dr. Tan. And, and, and for Mr. John Anne, um, for, for Georges Clemenceau, why, how, how do we explain his, his passion for, for Asia? Um, where, where, did these, uh, where did this passion and where did these views uh, actually originate? Could you share that with us? D'où viennent la passion de M. Clemenceau envers l'Asie et qu'est-ce qui a motivé en fait cette, cette passion qui a duré très longtemps Comme j'ai eu déjà l'occasion de le dire tout à l'heure, mais je crois qu'il faut y insister, il y a toujours eu d'abord chez lui une grande curiosité intellectuelle et un grand désir de ne pas se laisser enfermer dans dans un monde hérité. Il était prodigieusement cultivé pour ce qui était de la civilisation grecque et latine. Il lisait le grec et le latin dans le texte. Il considérait que c'était là une source fondamentale de la civilisation européenne et notamment française. Mais dans le même temps, chaque fois qu'il a pu s'exprimer à cet égard, il a marqué qu'il fallait ouvrir, 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 comparer comparer, rapprocher, marquer les différences. Et cela est le fait d'un esprit très large. J'ai l'impression, même si j'ai entendu très peu de choses de l'exposé, malheureusement, qui vient d'être fait, que c'était un point qu'il partageait avec, avec son ami, avec le docteur Boon Kang, qui lui-même avait été cherché du côté de la Grande-Bretagne, des, 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 des informations. Des... Je pense que cet appétit pour l'universalisme a dû rapprocher les deux hommes et a dû faire qu'il trouvait un langage commun. J'ajoute que Clémenceau, vous avez, vous avez dit, si j'ai bien compris, que le docteur Bunkeng était polyglotte, qu'il parlait un grand nombre de langues. C'était aussi le cas de Clémenceau, qui parlait très couramment l'anglais, ce qui était très très rare dans la, parmi le personnel politique de son temps, l'allemand aussi. Je pense que cela aussi, a également a dû, a dû les, les rapprocher et que cette, cette sympathie a compté. Là, du, la personnalité qui vient d'être évoquée de, de Boon Kang, il y, avait, il y avait chez Clémenceau un goût de, de comprendre, je le disais tout à l'heure, les, les, non seulement les civilisations, mais les religions étrangères. Et au fond, il était très méfiant à l'égard de civilisations monothéistes qui euh, fondaient 
leur, leur foi, leur dogme sur l'idée d'une relation personnelle entre un Dieu unique et, et, et la liberté des hommes. C'est la contre son tempérament. Je crois que la religion, les religions asiatiques telles qu'il les a comprises, étudiées, passionnément étudiées, correspondaient plus à son tempérament. Son tempérament, c'était celui d'un homme farouchement individualiste, farouchement libre, farouchement désireux de n'être jamais embrigadé dans aucune formation, dans aucune croyance et encore plus dans aucune secte, bien sûr. Et ce qu'il a compris et aimé de, de l'Asie, et c'est probablement pourquoi cette passion s'est affirmée et s'est affirmé continuellement dans sa carrière et à la fin en particulier, ce qu'il a aimé, je crois, c'est euh, cette part de tolérance, en somme, qui irrigue, je ne suis pas compétent, mais qui me semble irrigué, qui lui semblait irriguer les, les, les religions et les, les, les croyances asiatiques. Tout cela s'ajoutant au désir passionné qu'il avait de respecter les autres civilisations, et en particulier les civilisations asiatiques dont, je l'ai dit, il saluait l'antériorité par rapport à, à la civilisation des Lumières en Europe. So, indeed, uh, this sort of intellectual uh, curiosity, he, it was really something that he shared with uh, the doctor, um, uh, Dr. Lim Bun Ken. And um, he had a, an acute knowledge of uh, Greek and Latin civilization that uh, were at the root of uh, European uh, history and also uh, identity. Um, he's, he was willing not to be entrapped into um, a, a certain vision and he really, his, his motto was to open up, open up, compare, mark the differences and understand others and take also from the others what uh, could help us be better. Um, he also, uh, probably one thing that made uh, uh, Dr. Kang with uh, Clemenceau this sort of, that created a little bit of this friendship was probably um, this appetite for a certain universalism a common language that Dr. Uh, Kang went also uh, to Great Britain uh, to, to look for it. And um, just like uh, uh, Dr. Lim Bun Kang, uh, Clemenceau actually spoke not several languages, but he spoke very good English and German, which was quite rare at the time, especially for English. And also his appetite and his, his, uh, his great taste, his passion for uh, Asian civilizations also lied into uh, his, um, his, 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 uh, uh, his individuality, his, the fact that he, was, uh, he believed in the individual and he was strongly independent. And Asian civilizations for him uh, were um, a, a huge uh, ocean for tolerance. And for him, that reflected also uh, this uh, sort of uh, approach that he truly respected. And uh, it's also another reason for him uh, that uh, this opening up towards uh, Asian civilizations was even greater. Thank you. Il faut ajouter, si vous permettez, que la séquence historique qui est concerné ici, était particulièrement propre à, à faire surgir cette idée de liberté, dans le cas de la Chine continentale, avec la révolte des boxers, avec ensuite euh, Sun Yat-sen et, et la République chinoise, tout cela qu'il a passionnément euh, étudié, regardé à distance, qu'il a commenté dans ses, dans ses articles de journalistes qui sont innombrables, euh, tout cela a été fait pour euh, aiguillonner en lui ce qu'il y avait de curiosité à l'égard de la possibilité qu'en Asie aussi, finalement, la liberté individuelle triomphe de toutes les forces collectives d'oppression. He, it was, it's also interesting to underline the fact that he was very much interested in the sort of historical sequence that was happening at the moment, I mean at that time and even a little bit before with the boxers, uh, uh, the, the, the war of the boxers and all the different uh, struggles for uh, independence or for territory, etc. And really showing uh, that this will for independence and uh, this uh, utter um, uh, love for um, uh, getting the collective but for the better Uh, it was something really that he admired uh, in Asia. Il avait été d'ailleurs pendant la guerre de 14-18 sensible à l'aide qu'un certain nombre de, de, de Chinois avaient pu apporter au combat qui était celui de la France, de la Grande-Bretagne, des démocraties contre les pouvoirs centraux. Cela, je crois aussi, a compté. Il avait espéré que les Japonais enverraient des troupes. Ça n'a pas été le cas. Mais en revanche, il y a eu le sentiment qu'il y avait à ce moment-là quelque chose comme une que, comme une solidarité particulière avec l'ensemble de la Chine quels que soient les lieux où les Chinois s'étaient établis. 
he also had a, a profound respect actually uh, with what happened during World War I uh, between 14 and 18 and how um, the, the, the Chinese uh, uh, people had uh, helped uh, some of the French troops and also this sort of relationship, uh, well, a uh, uh, fighting relationship with, with the Japanese and how uh, the, the Chinese uh, civilization had really um, uh, re-erected itself uh, through this fight. En face de Singapour, il avait évidemment les réticences qu'il pouvait avoir comme anticolonialiste à l'égard de la colonisation britannique. Mais en même temps, il a très bien vu dans ses écrits que ce serait très probablement une période transitoire qui pourrait conduire ensuite vers une véritable liberté, une spécificité d'une partie de l'extrême-orient où on manifestait, il a beaucoup salué l'activité du port en particulier, où on manifestait une énergie économique qui pour lui ne pouvait être à terme que liée à une forme d'indépendance et probablement de liberté. He was also very attentive, uh, even though it was a little bit paradoxical, uh, about the situation of Singapore, who had a, a very central role uh, with its port. And he knew actually that even if it wasn't actually to be against the British, but this, um, this uh, col colony uh, was meant to be independent and strongly uh, established later. Thank you, Mr. Jeanonne. I, I, I appreciate the, how you have put together his, how, his, uh, how Clemenceau's educational background, um, as well as much of the historical uh, happenings, the, the context at that time really shaped uh, the way he, his, his own ideas and, and thinking. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if his uh, experience as a, as a journalist uh, uh, also contributed to that in, in opening uh, his mind. I, I, I think uh, you mentioned about how he was open to, 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 to looking at other cultures. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the, his, his position, uh, his, his time as a journalist and, and, as a, and, and, and I understand the time that he spent in the United States as well. J'ai beaucoup apprécié si le... Je... Vous avez entendu Je crois avoir compris. Je crois avoir à peu près compris. Donc, je peux répondre à ce que j'ai à peu près compris. C'était une question qui concernait la vocation de journaliste de Clémenceau. Je crois que vous avez tout à fait raison de mettre l'accent sur ce point. Il n'a pas été journaliste actif jusqu'aux années 1892-93. Mais à ce moment-là, des événements intérieurs à la France l'ont rejeté en dehors du Parlement. Il n'avait plus d'argent et il s'est mis à, en fait à, à, à écrire dans les journaux, les siens et d'autres, avec une énergie qui aujourd'hui nous laisse un peu stupéfaits. Il a créé et écrit des, des dizaines de milliers, de, de, enfin probablement près de 10 000 articles en tout cas, un très grand nombre. Il a publié un journal tout seul, hebdomadaire à un moment donné. Et ce journal, quand on le reprend, eh bien, on est frappé de voir à quel point les curiosités de Clémenceau s'élargissent bien au-delà des conflits intérieurs à la France, dont euh, il dénonce souvent parfois les côtés un peu étroits ou mesquins. Il y a au moins un article sur deux qui est tourné vers l'étranger et, et, et très souvent il s'intéresse à ce qui se passe effectivement du côté de l'extrême-orient, du côté des États-Unis bien sûr, mais aussi du côté de l'extrême-orient. Et, et on peut, avec les index de ces recueils qui ont été publiés récemment, mesurer à quel point... Euh, la Chine, le Japon aussi, qu'il a tellement regretté de ne pas pouvoir visiter, euh, n'en a pas eu le loisir, à quel point ces, ces, ces grandes civilisations orientales sont, sont présentes, à quel point il est curieux des grandes forces qui s'y déploient à la rencontre entre une civilisation de très long terme et les apports de la révolution industrielle et des conflits qui peuvent exister avec les, avec les pays qui ont, qui ont pris une avance industrielle avant... Euh, avant d'être à leur tour rattrapé. Je crois que vous avez raison, monsieur, d'indiquer que le rôle de Clémenceau, sa passion de journaliste est fondamentale. Et, et au fond, il a un œil, je dirais, comme l'ont dit certains romanciers, il a un œil, il a un regard. Et c'est pourquoi il aime tellement voyager, pourquoi il aime, dans des moments successifs, des rencontres qu'il peut faire, fixer et, et raconter dans sa correspondance et dire à ses amis ce qu'il aperçoit et en particulier ce qui lui paraît dans la diversité des moments comme symbolique, les événements qui informent au-delà d'eux-mêmes 
les personnalités qui parlent au-delà d'elles-mêmes sur la longue durée historique des, 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 des civilisations. Je crois que c'est cela qui s'est vu très très bien dans sa visite à Singapour et c'est probablement, pour autant que j'ai pu comprendre, l'exposé qui vient de nous être fait, c'est probablement ça qui a fondé aussi sa sympathie spontanée avec l'ami qu'il s'est fait à l'occasion de cette visite à Singapour avec le docteur Boon Kang. Je crois que c'est au fond cette image-là que j'ai envie qu'on retienne de ce vieux monsieur octogénaire arrivant à Singapour. Il a représenté au-delà de la France, au-delà de l'amitié entre nos deux pays, il a représenté à ce moment-là quelque chose de très durable, c'est-à-dire l'idée que sur la culture peut se fonder un, une relation spécifique lorsqu'on vise les mêmes propos, c'est-à-dire finalement, euh, finalement l'autonomie la, de, de l'individu, sa prospérité, euh, dans un climat de liberté pour que chacun puisse s'épanouir. Je crois que c'est ça le message. Ça a l'air un peu solennel, mais finalement nous en avons besoin aujourd'hui de ce message-là. Et c'est pourquoi, cent ans après, cette visite de Clémenceau à Singapour, telle que ces cérémonies l'évoquent magnifiquement, euh, cette, euh, ce moment-là, mérite d'être remémoré, raconté, expliqué aux nouvelles générations à qui nous allons passer le flambeau dans peu de temps. So he's never been really a very active uh, journalist before uh, 1892 and 93. Um, and thereon, as he was rejected from the parliament, he started writing uh, uh, frantically uh, ten, like thousands of articles, and it's roughly 10,000 articles that, was, uh, that, that were uh, listed uh, at that time. Uh, there was even uh, a newspaper that he started publishing on his own. And uh, we can see that in, in those articles, his curiosity uh, goes beyond the French context. His idea of opening up, opening up, was a constant motto even in his writings. And he was actually showing how much also these uh, other civilizations could be uh, very much learned from. And uh, of course the Asian civilization and his dear Japan that he strongly regretted uh, he, because he had never visited it uh, even uh, uh, during his, uh, his visit in uh, Southeast Asia. And he was also uh, showing how all these great forces that were spread out in, the, in this uh, huge uh, region um, were quite fundamental in the, in the idea of uh, the Asian civilization. And when you were talking about uh, his, um, his journalistic uh, idea, how he behaved in a way as a journalist, it's quite also essential to understand that uh, his uh, journalistic uh, skills helped him also to understand uh, very quickly what was happening in certain moments. He had, he could pinpoint the symbolic of certain moments and in a way the historicity of, uh, of what was at stake. Um, he represented in a way with this visit a sort of durable idea uh, that a special relation can always be uh, built upon a sort of cultural message. Culture could be the root of a, a special relation. And that's what probably what happened between uh, George Clemenceau and uh, Mr. Uh, Lim Boon Kang. And even though it might sound a little bit solemn, uh, I think we need, uh, we need that in, in, in this moment where um, uh, events are turning upside down our world, uh, we can see how this uh, moment can be very representative. I fully agree. Que nous allons, je crois que nous allons clore malheureusement cette rencontre, mais vous me permettrez de, de redire, je crois que le temps est achevé, de redire à la fin à quel point je suis personnellement reconnaissant et comme le musée Clémenceau est reconnaissant et le milieu intellectuel où nous évoluons est reconnaissant à tous ceux qui ont pu organiser cette rencontre. Je suis très frustré de ne pas être parmi vous, d'autant plus que ça m'a privé d'une partie de la compréhension de ce qui a été dit. J'espère en avoir le texte écrit possible. Mais, mais vraiment, je vous remercie et merci de m'avoir convié pour participer à cette fête entre la France et Singapour. C'est précieux. Merci beaucoup.
I, I really want uh, to uh, again uh, say that I am very grateful uh, for this organization and this uh, moment, uh, even though I feel very frustrated uh, for not being here and not having been also able to fully understand, heard actually, uh, what um, uh, Dr. Tan had said about Dr. Lim Bun Ken. Uh, and I hope actually I will get uh, some uh, elements, um, uh, written elements of it uh, soon because it sounded very interesting. And I really want to underline that this moment is absolutely necessary and it's wonderful that we are able to celebrate it together. Thank you, Mr. Jalane. Um, on, on, on that note, I'd I, I like to, to uh, pass the, the mic to Dr. Tan as well. Um, on, on that same question. Same question. Yeah. How, how, how can we uh, explain uh, the, uh, Dr. Lim Boon King's uh, I ideas? Where did they come from? He, you, you, yes. you shared that he had a rather humble yeah. uh, beginning as well. Um, was well, it was in Edinburgh, for example? Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think uh, Mr. Janade has already mm -hmm. mentioned many of these elements. So I will mm. only pinpoint something that I think was quite common, mm. not just among these two great men, but among a number of people from that same era. Mm. And that is that they were all beneficiaries in a way of a sort of liberal enlightenment kind of education that you don't normally get these days, right? So you were encouraged to read beyond. You were encouraged to read so-called canonical great works and men like Clemenceau and Lim Boon King, beyond making use of this very good education, were anxious to deploy them in some way to making their own countries better. And that was the key. For Lim Boon King, he was a man of science, he had medicine, and so he thought, well, if I could contribute seriously right, with my medical knowledge, uh, I could reform parts of China and of Singapore, Malaya, all right? And, 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 and this is the kind of instinct. And in that sense, because of that wide range of reading that they did, that education that they had, they were internationalists, they were your modern cosmopolitans. They did not feel that they were tied down in, in any way by any traditions uh, you, you know, because those could well be impediments for growth and improvement. W would you agree that then that was, uh, that explains how Dr. Lim Boon King, and, and I guess uh, for George Clemenceau as well, how well they were able to balance these multiple identities. I, you, you know, as a straight Chinese, for example, as somebody being quite pro-British in some way, but also with allegiances to China. Um, we talked just now about them uh, being uh, not religious, but yet at the same time uh, respecting culture very much as a cultural patriot, like you mentioned. Yeah, I, I think, mm. uh, well, I don't know the kind of mm. uh, battles they would have had in their hearts and minds. Mm. But quite clearly, because you had uh, an inclusive and international outlook, mm. uh, it made it harder for you to be overly dogmatic about any particular point of view. You, had, you, 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 you knew that there was something bigger than what you were living in, and so, if you were going to try and understand humankind, and that's why I said they were humanists, you were trying to understand humankind, mm. then you would need to adopt that kind of an inclusive, broader uh, perspective of life and beliefs and ideas. Mm. Mr. Jardone, would you agree uh, that that was uh, a similar uh, approach to, 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 to life and to thinking that, that, that Mr. Clemenceau had as well? Êtes-vous d'accord que justement Clemenceau avait aussi cette vision très humaniste, très, très inclusive par rapport au rôle de la religion uh, que, monsieur, uh, que le Dr. King oui, oui, il a, toute son œuvre, toute son action a été marquée, je le disais tout à l'heure, par une grande curiosité envers les diverses religions et, et en même temps une extrême méfiance à l'égard du dogme. Un des signes de cette, cette passion, c'est la curiosité extrême qu'il a toujours eue pour, 
pour le polythéisme gréco-latin, qu'il a préparé peut-être d'ailleurs une curiosité vers les, vers les religions orientales. L'idée de, euh, du panthéon grec euh, était, très, était très présente chez lui. Il a écrit un recueil d'articles de, de, qui s'appelait « Le grand pan » en évoquant cette... Euh, cette divinité grecque qui représentait la diversité de, de ce que pouvait euh, charrier le, le monde de l'Olympe, si vous voulez. Et ça, ça a été évidemment très, très important. Il a toujours... Euh, sa bibliothèque du musée Clémenceau est à cet égard tout à fait significative. Il y a un grand nombre de livres consacrés aux religions, euh, religions gréco-latines et aux religions également orientales. Il en avait une grande curiosité, je le disais tout à l'heure, pas de dogme en effet, méfiance à l'égard du dogme, curiosité à l'égard de, de l'ensemble de ce qui a porté l'humanité à s'interroger sur l'infini et sur le mystère absolu de, 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 de l'espace et du temps. He indeed had a, a great curiosity towards religion, um, but indeed he was also very wary um, uh, towards dogma. And um, he, he had a, also a very uh, great interest in, in the polytheistic uh, aspect of uh, Greek civilization and how the Olympian world uh, was organized and, and the influence they would have later on, on uh, the, the cultural Europe. And um, he even wrote a, a book called The Great Pan, Uh, talking about this Olympian world. And he, he was actually a man who was in, strongly interested in all these uh, religious aspects, but without having them uh, uh, to rule uh, the political and, uh, and the social world. Thank you. I think, I think it's, that's the kind of cultural openness that, that is very much needed today as well. And, and I think what we have talked about today, uh, I mean, I would like to thank Mr. Jean Nene, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Tan as well for, for sharing with us um, something of such great historical interest, but, uh, but I would say of, uh, of great uh, contemporary relevance as well. Uh, and I'm sure uh, all of you tuning in at home will, will definitely agree. Um, I, I, I would like to, to share with everyone and inform you that the, the 2020 edition uh, of, of Voila France Singapore Festival has uh, started yesterday on the 22nd of October uh, and it will run until the 22nd of November uh, and all the lineups uh, of the programs are available at voila.sg. Um, and uh, if you're in Singapore and you're able to visit us here at the National Museum, um, the, the exhibition Clemenceau in Singapore uh, will be open later today um, in the presence of the Singapore Minister for Culture, Community and Youth, uh, Mr. Edwin Tong. So, so do, do come uh, and, uh, and, and, and view the exhibition and, and learn more about uh, what we have talked about today. So once again, thank you to our distinguished guests um, and thank you uh, to all of you at home for, for tuning in. Goodbye.